So, I mean, that was a very, very quick, practical breakdown of some of the things we could do um, in a very descriptive way, uh, given the, the short time uh, that we had allocated, but I'm obviously more than happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you very much, uh, Diane. Right, um, for those of you who are arriving late, um, there is plenty of space down here towards the front of the room. Um, as I said at the start, um, and everybody was here, um, I do want to make sort of the next half hour or so um, is interactive and sort of discursive, and I really want to sort of bring in uh, the views and experiences and ideas of the sort of pool of people who come here tonight as much as uh, those of the panel. Um, so just before, uh, just before I sort of open the things up to the floor, um, my first question is one that I'm going to sort of throw back to, to um, probably down this end of the panel. Um, <coughs> Omar and uh, Isabel, um, you both talked about um, Islamophobia as being, or possibly sort of trying to steer a definition of it, um, as I think you term, what you termed it as being anti-Muslim racism. Um, now, um, my understanding of um, the legislation is that racism has got a very different definition from uh, religious uh, religious prejudice and uh, uh, sort of criticism of religion. Um, and I think people who've experienced racism will say that it's very different from criticism of people's faith. And so, why why is it that you that you're sort of uh, why is it that you're aiming to rebrand Islamophobia in that uh, in those terms? What what do you think that that will do to to help communities and uh, help the government tackle this? Yeah, no, I think it's uh, it's a good question. I mean, as I as I tried to sort of suggest, one of the reasons is I think it opens up to the wider kind of policy discussion, not merely about sort of hate crime, and I think the other thing is, um, the reality is that we do live, uh, and, and we live in a society where criticizing ideas is acceptable. So I think if you start defining uh, Islamophobia in terms of the uh, criticism of Islam, full stop, I think you're going to have a very difficult time, not simply in terms of free speech, but even in terms of the question of what is Islam, uh, which as we know is a relatively vexed one. Um, and as I say, I think the, the definition that looks at the effects on people's lives, whether that's not getting a job, whether that's beaten up in the streets, etc., uh, you don't need to sort of tackle questions of what is Islam and what isn't Islam. Um, but and people can be free. I, I, I mean, my sort of take on this is uh, criticizing ideas is a hallmark of a free society, but discriminating against individuals is the hallmark of an unjust one. And we also, just one final thing, because I didn't say this, is we we link it to the wider UN definition, I'm not going to read it out, but it, it works in terms of the definition of racism that the United Nations provides, so that's sort of point one, but point two is the UK government is assigned a signatory to the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which means that we, the UK government, is obliged to sort of sign, sign uh, up to anything that follows from that, so um, yeah, that's... Um, but just coming back to, to what you said there, Isabel, I'll bring you in just a moment. Just coming back to what you said there, I mean, you said that Muslims are suffering, sort of being yeah. attacked on the streets, you're saying that Muslims are, um, are discriminated against or, for whatever reason, not as able to access yes. employment and the professions and everything. But how much of that is actually down to them being Muslim, and how much of that is down to them being of ethnic minority backgrounds or immigrant sure. backgrounds or being from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds? It just seems as though it's relatively easy to distill the two things, and that you're possibly trying to muddy the waters. No, uh, well, that's not, obviously I don't, I don't think that. I mean, I think uh, all forms of, you know, race, racism can exist without races. I mean, races are sort of sociologically nonsense, right? So the, the point is, that, right, I mean, this is a sort of widespread sort of view of all forms of racism. I mean, I think Isabel's point around cultural racism is important. But in my view, all forms of racism exhibit that element, right? So the sorts of pathologies and stereotypes that we attribute to black people or to Jewish people are not just based on their race as such. It's racism takes the form of subscribing particular characteristics and behaviors to the group in question that are pathological and other as, as the way that Isabel described. And I would further say, that a white group, yes, can be racialized. So in the 19th century, Irish, Irish people in Britain were, I would say, experiencing racist stereotypes about things like phrenology. I mean, you just have to read 19th century racist texts to see that that's in fact 
well, what the British state was saying. And furthermore, that if uh, hate crime increases and the media uh, dis sort of treatment of Eastern European increases, that Polish people could become racialized as a group in Britain and were on the way there. So to me, it's no, that is the definition of, of racism for, for all groups. And I, I think the other point I want to make on that, it's not just a sort of intellectual or conceptual issue. It's also about aligning with other groups who face similar forms of discrimination. And I think, you know, there are only three million Muslims in Britain. I think it's both a principal point that if you're opposed to one form of racism, you should be opposed to all forms of racism. Um, and then I think it's also a tactical point, which is, you know, we have wider allies around issues of social justice and human rights out here in Britain. And of course, indeed, a lot of white British people who are opposed to discrimination. And if we frame it in terms of discrimination, and racism, I think it's not only more accurate sociologically, it's a more effective way. Uh, I'm open to calling it something, I, I am open to other definitions. I think the key thing for me is you need the institutional and structural element, and the other key thing is you do need to allow for, I think Muslims have to allow for, the fact that Islam can be criticized. There are, you know, there, that can cross the line, but I think we, that, you're, I think you're having the wrong debate if you're debating about civilizational ideas. We don't need to have that debate to, to sort of outlaw and respond to a lot of the outcomes that we see Muslims suffering from. And in fact, I think the outcomes would be better if we focused on things like poverty, inequality, discrimination, than if we focused on a battle of ideas between Christianity and Islam and secularism. And Isabel, your, your thoughts on the same point, then? Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more that we need to move away from this kind of, uh, from the semantic debate about Islamophobia is a fear of Islam. We need to move away from the kind of the clash of, of ideas. When we're talking about Islamophobia, even though the word itself contains Islam and phobia, we are not talking about a fear of Islam. We are talking about the manifestation of a hatred for a people. And, and in practical terms, actually, Islamophobia is often conflated with racism and it's conflated with ethnicity as well, um, which is actually another reason why it's quite hard to tackle, particularly on the ground. Police forces sometimes don't know whether to classify an attack or whatever instance it is as racist or um, religiously motivated, whether it's Islamophobia or whether it's racism, because the two are so intimately combined and because it manifests itself as a form of racism that's how we need to approach it and if we're going to approach it as a form of racism we need to understand it as a form of racism because yeah. that's what it is i mean just one other quick thing i do think it i agree there's some counterintuitiveness i mean one thing is you know somali muslims versus white muslims versus you know asian muslims i don't want to so i don't want to I don't want to totally paper over this. As I said, it is partly tactical, but I just think it's principle. That is also true, though, of course, for Jews. So anti-Semitism is anti-Jewish racism, even though there are Ethiopian Jews, uh, there are Moroccan Jews, and there are uh, Ashkenazi Jews from, from sort of Eastern Europe. Uh, and their ethnicity does look like it. I mean, th their phenotype sometimes differs, but they all face uh, anti-Semitism. And I think, analogously, we can say something about Muslims, and I think if you look at the definition of a racial group that did uh, in the 80s pass uh, in Britain to, to define Sikhs and Jews, you will find that the, 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 that the definition and the determinants data they make for a racial group actually would apply to Muslims. Uh, I, I actually think that a smart lawyer could bring a case that could fit within uh, that definition. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to, to open things up to the floor now, um, so if anybody's got any questions, if you want to put your hands up, I'll come around, come around the room as, uh, as far and wide as I can. Um, so, chat them down here, then I'll come to, to you, sir, just afterwards. Yeah. Uh, good evening, thanks a lot. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that de the definition is important because it helps us understand how we, how we respond to it. Yeah. And I think uh, a definition should be comprehensive in the sense that Islamophobia doesn't just involve Muslims, but it involves Sikhs, Hindus, yes. dark-skinned people, light-skinned people. It involves society. We're not just talking about Muslims here, we're talking about Islamophobia. Just, uh, just wanted to make that point. Yeah, no. yeah I, say, I, think, I think it's a good point. I mean, I'm sure many of you will have heard um, in the media this week about a Sikh gentleman who was, uh, was attacked yeah. here in London. Um, 
I'm not, I think he was, he was visibly Sikh, he was wearing a turban, but... Uh, yeah, in the United States, Sikhs are routinely attacked, the first, killed. The first person killed after 9-11 was Sikh. Was Sikh uh, from uh, Texas. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. We have a, we have a, a, a chapter on the back of the Sikh individual who's experienced Sikh. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, uh, yeah, gentlemen down here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, so I, I understand uh, uh, the point about uh, you know, the manifestation of Islamophobia, and that is the thing that we are discussing. But I, I wonder if you know, in, uh, in all this discussion, we sometimes uh, do end up denying uh, that uh, there is nothing to fear from Islam, because of course there are people who espouse the narrative that Islam is meant to kind of dominate the world and it's, 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 uh, it is going to be the final religion and stuff like that. So, and, and I see kind of strange reactions to that. Uh, one of them is, for example, Sam Harris, who is, you know, purportedly is like a very super liberal guy, but when it comes to Islam, he thinks that, you know, there's definitely something wrong with Islam. Mm -hmm. And on the, on the other uh, side, we see kind of a, a strange reaction from Muslims where they, you know, Sufism jumps in and says, oh no, no Islam is all about you know, love and kawali and you know, you know, all good things. So we, we kind of people kind of react to uh, this this uh, this question in kind of a strange way. So are we are we correctly framing this question and asking all you know, looking at all aspects, or are we just just focusing on certain reactions, you know, or manifestations where you know people have been harmed? Okay, do you want to speak to Okay, so, I mean, there's quite a lot to unpick there, but I would say this. I think that uh, there are very many people who are vocal about different aspects of Islam and Muslims and Muslim groups. Uh, there are those who are very vocal in the, and imposing of their form of a very strict conservative Islam, and they want that, maybe they want that imposed on the entire Muslim world, maybe even the entire, the entire world. But I think we have to be sensible and remember, that's a tiny minority of people. <laughs> they don't represent the majority of Muslims, and they don't, they don't represent the majority of the diversity in all of Islam and its ideology. Second of all, those people like Sam Harris, who are very ideologically against that uh, strict conservative form of Islam, are also a minority of people in their liberal I would say actually anti-liberal views of what Muslim and Islam are, and they misrepresent, also they fall into that trap of misrepresenting what they say most Muslims think and feel, because they think that all Muslims think like that minority of conservative strict Muslims. So I think sometimes we need to be very sensible about how we understand uh, the numbers. Uh, so I don't think that because we may be ignoring so those types of examples in the way that we may frame Islamophobia and how we talk about Islamophobia uh, is necessarily a bad thing because actually we probably shouldn't focus too much on that because it's divisive and it's unrepresentative. Um, if that, if that sort of I also wonder question. what can you do about it from a kind of policy point of view about Sam Harris. It's quite, I mean, I agree, I agree he's a problem. And he, he, I think what you can do is where the words and act feed into acts and incitement. If you could show that, and, but I think we have the law. I mean, it could be strengthened. I agree, but I think you know you can't get into. I, I think in a liberal society, it's also going to be hard to. What more can we do in terms of policy and practice to to shut down Sam Harris other than to shun him? In terms of that, that's I think the best you, you can do and argue against him. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that we need to get policymakers, we need to get our communities focusing on the things that are actually going to help us in the next five to ten years and beyond. Just if I can just throw something back to you, Omar, and I don't bring you uh, back in as well. Um, you just said something very revealing there. You just said, what can we do to shut down Sam Harris? Yeah, well, is, is that, I mean, <coughs> I'm, I'm not going really yeah, sort of go into his, sure, his sure. perspective or his views or anything, but is that not sort of the criticism that comes back to, um, to Critiquing sort of the whole argument against yeah, that's why I said it, it, yeah. it's being used as yeah. it's being used as a tool and label to shut down and just let the bay. Yeah, no, that's why I'm saying don't 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 deny that that's perfectly legitimate. But I don't. That's why I'm saying I don't think we can. I, yeah, I I agree, and that's one of the reasons why I think we we shouldn't be enticed into is I suppose more what I mean. I, I don't. I, I don't really feel any need to join a debate that I agree with Hayan is is marginal and is more about 
his uh, raising the profile of his own interests rather than anything real. It's wildly disproportionate, both within liberal concerns and within the Muslim community, what he's focusing on. And so we should not take the bait. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I completely agree with all of it. You know, we need to. We don't necessarily need to take take the bait. Um, I think we need to keep things in perspective, and this is kind of a bit of a tangent, but it surprises me the continual need for justification that you don't find in other religions. If you compare the Bible to the Quran, the levels of violence found in each, it, it just surprises me that we're not asking other religions to continually justify themselves. So we do need to raise awareness of perhaps about what Islam is, and that's part of kind of community engagement and understanding between individuals. But constantly being on the defensive is perhaps, although sometimes it becomes necessary, I think there needs to be more proactive, productive ways, or positive ways forward. Um, so awareness ways are raising, but keeping things in perspective. But on this point of continually asking Muslims to justify themselves, that, that in my opinion is an issue that we all need to think about. Why is it that after any terrorist attack, every Muslim is all of a sudden supposed to condemn the attack, as opposed to be somehow inherently some kind of bear some responsibility for that? It's not in a way that you don't see after, say, the Finsbury Park attack. All of a sudden, white people weren't being asked to defend, or you know, it's just this idea of continually justifying. I think um, is part of a wider narrative that falls into Islamophobia, constantly questioning what Muslims are and who they are, I, I think that justification needs to be thought back as well. Okay, uh, gentlemen down here, the police uh, person. Thank you very much. Um, just a point of, because we're talking about definitions, I think saying things like conservative, strict, I don't think it's very helpful for the debate if we're going to be careful about language. There are many Muslims who are very strict, very conservative, but they're law-abiding and that's their thing, right? So I think we need to be careful there. Um, second point uh, for Allah. What, what is the impediment for actually reaching some consensus on what the definition is? Because it seems to be that, kind of we've understood it, racism touches on that structural element that then gives us protection. So, I mean, what's, what's stopping Muslims coming together, agreeing on a definition, and then putting it out there for the community and working towards that? Okay, I mean, I... I hope I hope nothing. It's, this is a very pleasing response, but I do hang on. I mean, it's great for me to you know, other three of us to have intellectually come to this through our studies or whatever. But I think it needs to be useful, resonant, and understandable uh, to to the community itself. And I think also um, there is, I think, uh, a challenge with with government. I think they, whether or not they'll take it, I don't know, but we'll we'll see. I mean, uh, I think there is a view, partly also, that Islamophobia rather than providing a definition for it, you should replace it with some other term, right? So, uh, rather than say that Islamophobia is anti-Muslim racism, what we should be saying is, let's stop talking about Islamophobia and let's talk about anti-Muslim racism. And so, scrap the term completely. So why, how do you yeah, I mean, I think, the... yeah, I think the reason we haven't gone down that route is I felt that that would then become the debate, you know? If, if I published a report that said, scrap from Islamophobia, you know, that would be the whole debate. And I think we, whatever we think of the term, and maybe if we were starting over from scratch in 2018, we might do something different. It is the, the state of the art, that's what people understand it. It is true that even within kind of uh, mainstream society, people know what Islamophobia is. It has some resonance. Anti-Semitism is not the best term. Homophobia is not the best term. Anti-Semitism picks out Semites who include non-Jews. But only now a pedant makes that kind of complaint. Over time, language shifts. We don't open up a dictionary to find out what. I mean, I, mean, I know you know this, but all I'm saying is um, Islamophobia now has resonance. And so if we were to, I think, say replace it completely, we'd muddy the waters further. And homophobia, similarly, is not merely about fear of gay people, it's about the discriminatory outcomes that they experience in virtue of being gay in our society. And so, again, I got. I think it's, we can have these pedantic debates about what the term means, but I think if we, if we define it correctly, it will help. And I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, that you think yourself and the rest of the community would, would, would endorse that. So. Yeah, and I'd like to think that actually that this, 
maybe I'm a bit more cynical, but I think one of the only things that is actually stopping us from uh, practically coming together is there may be some individuals and organisations that want to be seen to be doing this work themselves rather than doing it collectively. So there is this uh, this challenge of, of, of trying to, to communicate that it, it isn't the competition and we're all, we're all on the same team. Mm. Uh, we need to come together in that sense. And I'm not suggesting that the Renovate Trust or MEND or anybody else is, <laughs> on this panel is, is, is guilty of that. I'm just saying there may be some, uh, maybe it's a case of uh, humbling ourselves in, and just coming to that consultative forum. I, I, I endorse that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a few, maybe. <coughs> um, just before I go back to the floor, um, a few hands sort of going up, and I will come back to you, but I'm just very conscious that all the people that we've heard of from the audience so far tonight have been men. Um, and I, I do want to sort of hear from, uh, hear from the sisters and sort of get their views as well. So, uh, so th th thanks for your questions, and I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, but gentleman down here had his hand up here. Two quick questions. Firstly, for Ian, uh, there's clearly amongst the community a lot of scepticism about the government's role regards to this type of thing, whether it's prevent, or Trojan horse, or those kinds of things. As someone who's on working groups, is there any reassurance you can give us that they're doing anything uh, that we'd be interested in? And the second, actually, just a quick question is that one of the common features in the discussion is about the media and the culpability of the media. In an ideal world, if you had the resources that you needed, how would you go about tackling that problem? <laughs> Good question. Uh, okay, so uh, giving the reassurances and in the context of things like Prevent and Trojan Horse. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> I'll give the reassurance seconds and maybe that'll make you feel better. Uh, in terms of the context of things like Prevent and allegations of Trojan Horse that turned out to be not a Trojan Horse, um, I think that first of all they're lessons for government and government needs to engage in a genuine listening exercise to see how they got it wrong uh, in any situation and see how they can improve their understanding and not repeat those things. Because the danger of not doing so means that they uh, uh, malign and uh, encourage the disengagement of Muslims further. Sorry, apologize. Um, uh, and that's not going to be conducive to social cohesion and engagement and the public good generally. Um, so I think that's only lessons that the, the government themselves have to reflect on. In terms of uh, people like myself who engage with the government in uh, working groups, um, we may not be very public about the work that we do uh, or, or advertise our successes, but there have been many. So, for example, most recently, um, or about a year and a half ago, um, the uh, Home Office opened up a uh, Places of Worship uh, security funding scheme that was for any organized uh, place of worship that was a victim of uh, physical attacks or, or, or arson or things like that, or any of their congregants who were victims of, of anti-Muslim or racial or religious hatred, those organisations could apply for funding to beef up security. Uh, that, that example of a, of, a, of a policy change was a result of uh, myself and one other colleague who sits on the working group who created the, 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 the programme, presented the Home Office and then they, they sort of uh, created an implementation that they were happy with, but that came out of an idea that two of us put together. Um, the, hate, uh, the Home Office's Hate Crime Action Plan that Theresa May unveiled when she was the Home Secretary. I think seven of the recommendations in there were uh, created out of ideas and consultation that members of the Antiquism Hatred Working Group uh, uh, put forward. So, um, I guess reflecting on that, it's up to us also as independent members of that working group, who by the way are independent from government. So. We criticise them, sometimes quite harshly, in the room. Um, but they're private conversations, and I think that they're good that they're private, but I think also that we could do a better job in telling communities to reassure them that this is what we have achieved, that this is what we've done. So it does work, but it is a slow process, and, and, and hopefully there'll be more of that genuine engagement that, that, that goes on. Okay, I'm going to come to the link down here. Okay, I'm a teacher. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, yeah, question on that. me. Yeah, I'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, just about it. So media is actually something we can do a lot about. So um, firstly, we can talk about regulation. Actually, no, we can start from a different point. The Leveson Inquiry back in 2011. After the phone hacking scandal um, and, all of, and all of the unethical practices were exposed, um, under the, after the Leveson Inquiry, newspapers could no longer um, 
hack phones, basically stalk people um, perform, uh, perform all these practices that they have been doing to get a sensationalised story. But they still need to sell newspapers. Um, something that I find quite heartening, you might not, is that every day 500 people in this country buy the Daily Mail for the last time. Yeah? That print print um, newspapers are struggling for business, they need to sell the newspapers, so they have to find other stories, and they have to find another way to fill that space for sensationalist reporting. And unfortunately, the target of that has been minority groups, and Muslims in particular. So, one of the recommendations um, of Leveson Inquiry that then went into the Royal Charter um, on media regulation, one component of that that kind of underpins it and makes it all work is Section 40. Now, Section 40 is a piece of legislation that makes it so that newspapers have to sign up to an independent regulator. Um, and within that, there are also clauses that say that if you do not sign up to the independent regulator, you must pay all court costs for anyone that wants to bring a complaint, as long as it is a legitimate complaint, regardless of whether um, you win, lose, draw, whatever. So, that, so it allows people to more effectively take their cases to court when they feel like they've been discriminated against. Now, that piece of legislation has not yet been triggered by government. All, people, all legislation has um, kind of, um, like an administrative period where um, committees or whatever is needed can be set up um, before that piece of legislation goes live. We are waiting for one signature on this piece of legislation that the Conservative government is holding out on. This administrative period is not designed so that um, cross-party agreements and legislation that has already gone through Parliament can be revoked. It's not supposed to be for that, but that is what this time is currently being used for. So we need to be really pushing the government to fully trigger Section 40 so that it can uphold um, its commitments to media regulation. Also, um, the Racial and Religious Hate Crime Act of 2006 that I was talking about earlier, um, if we were able to um, to, if we take that to independent review and maybe sort out some of the problems with that, it would provide greater protection because you don't see Jews being treated the same way as Muslims in newspapers, and that's because of this legislation. We also have a problem with diversity in the media, within journalism and in broadcasting, in that we don't, um, it's still very much um, a white and very much male um, industry. And if we were to have, if we were to find ways and initiatives of encouraging more people from BME backgrounds into journalism and into broadcasting, they would bring with it, um, would it would bring with them um, a greater understanding of the nuances within stories within communities um, and wider perspectives. Um, and a final thing that we can be doing is being more proactive within communities ourselves. Where there are positive stories that we can highlight, we need to be taking those to the media, we need to be taking them to journalists and framing it and saying there is a story here. Um, and we, we just we need to be creating the stories ourselves and creating the get the engagement ourselves. I go on all day. Now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And conscious of uh, time, I think we've got sort of time for one more question. I will go down to the lady down here. Sorry, I jumped the gun and uh, to invite you to to see. Uh, I I enjoyed everything. Thank you all. Uh, I'm a teacher, and it breaks my heart when I think uh, children are not getting the right education, the right nutrition. And I find it like a catch-22. The more it goes, the more the Muslim community are going to, I mean, they are going to turn to the right, to the wrong uh, ways. And I mean, all we heard was really what the government should do, what maybe, uh, I want to know what the Muslim community also, what are our responsibility? Because sometimes I put myself on the other side and I say, if I see the news every day, I will be terrified from these people. And this is a fact. So what can we do to change, at least be proactive in changing the narrative? OK, that's a, that's a great uh, question for us to sort of maybe, uh, maybe round up on. So <coughs> if, I'm, if I maybe start with you, Payan, what, what more can we as a community do to sort of lead the way here? Uh, definitely proactive. Uh, engagement in tackling this needs to be uh, better than just complaining about it or whinging about it. Unfortunately, a lot of us whinge about it and don't do it. Um, and uh, we've got every right to whinge about it because the circumstances and the conditions are unfortunately uh, the way that they are. However, what are the things that we can be doing? So, if you read something in the newspaper, complain to it so. 
or any other press regulator. But if you see something in the news or in a feature that is incorrect, inaccurate, insightful, complain to the editors, complain to Ofcom. If you um, uh, are not happy generally with the narrative around Muslims, uh, which most of us are not, encourage young Muslims to become journalists because editorial rooms will be, be better when, there are, when they are more diverse, but also because most senior editors and, and controllers of news content will be more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They will consider the, the more, a more nuanced background and information about people of different backgrounds, if that makes sense. So, um, uh, but also, um, you know, even when it comes to incitement on Twitter, you know, um, when thing, people like Katie Hopkins tweets, everybody expects that uh, somebody else is going to do something about it. All it takes is for one person to make a criminal complaint. Until the police receive a criminal complaint, they're not going to proactively fish for crimes that may or may not have been committed online. So, um, make a criminal complaint. And I think it's also, people need to understand the processes involved in making a criminal complaint. Um, so, when, uh, so, a hate crime is not an offence on its own. You know, it's not like a statutory defined offence. Uh, hate crimes are prosecuted uh, because uh, uh, the sentencing is aggravated because of a feature of, of, of a person is uh, attacked because of their identity or background or race or religion in the commission of an offence. And so when that evidence is there, it extends the, the sentence or the punishment. So when complaining to the police about being the victim of hate crime, you need to tell them words or things that were said and done that suggest that you have become a victim because of your identity. Because that is what the Crown Prosecution Service needs to prove. Um, and because of uh, a lack of understanding of these processes and sometimes lack of communication on those matters between the police and CPS, this is why sometimes you see uh, what should have been an anti uh, racial or what should have been a religious hate crime prosecution turned out to be a racial hate crime prosecution because some of those elements didn't exist or because the police didn't realize that they should have been looking for them. So I think we need to understand all of these processes. Uh, in terms of process, sorry, just to quickly uh, talk about Ipso again. You need to understand that when you make a complaint to Ipso, there are various different schedules to make a complaint under. If you get it wrong, Ipso doesn't correct your complaint. If you get it wrong, Ipso just says, no, your complaint has not been uh, found, and it moves on. So you need to understand uh, the entire process. So I think um, uh, engagement with the processes uh, need to be done more proactively from communities. Okay, thank you, Carl. Uh, Isabel. Um, unfortunately, my answer to this one is going to be a massive publication of MEND. So MEND is Muslim Engagement and Development, and um, we have something like 26 working groups up and down the country, um, which involve almost a thousand volunteers. And what we, our, may, our aim is to make sure that British Muslims become actively engaged within politics and within media. And how we go about that is we have um, campaigns, so we have the Get Out and Vote campaign, just encouraging people to vote, doesn't matter who they vote for, but making sure that they get out and get involved within political processes. But also we provide education, we provide masterclasses, so that in, they're not just for Muslims, it's so that anybody can understand how the media works, how politics works, how to complain to your MP, how, how to actually be involved. Um, how many people in this room actually know how a piece of legislation goes through Parliament? I certainly didn't before I started working for MEND. Um, but we provide this information so that people can actively become involved within within um, civic life. We we'll provide toolkits um, and easy read guides on how to complain to IPSO, on how to um, on how to navigate the different clauses within the editor's code of practice. Um, we also um, provide toolkits on how to report a hate crime, what to do in the state of, um, if you experience um, uh, any Islamophobic abuse. Um, and also we have our IRU that I was talking about earlier, the Islamophobia Response Unit. Even if you don't want to get involved with MEND, even if you don't want to go to any of the educational classes or anything like that, we have an app. Um, and if you download that app, whenever something like, I don't know, the Ofsted hijab case comes up, whenever Melanie, um, Melanie Phillips or Katie Hopkins says something outrageous on Twitter, whatever, whatever it is, 
we do an action alert that as long as you turn the notification on on your phone, um, it pops up and it tells you what to do. It will provide you template letters to send to your MPs. It will provide you with whatever information it is that you, um, so that you can actively get involved when these issues come up, um, so you know what to do. Um, so, Mental Muslim Engagement and Development, have a look at our website, come and get a, a business card off me later. Apologies for being a massive, <laughs> immodest figure, but that is one way to get involved in these cases. Thanks very much, and uh, Omar? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree both at the sort of high level, try to pop it, influence policy and also kind of grassroots community organizing, so I endorse both those things and I don't want to sound like I, I don't agree with them, but I think there is a further thing, which is to be engaged in, in other non-Muslim kind of organizations and, and to sort of uh, join sort of fights for, say, racial justice that ex uh, other groups experience, join, uh, and I think Muslims do do this, but I think it's a good way uh, to, to make those causes also understand the issue of Islamophobia more because, you know, I think there should be a quid pro quo if we're going to fight for your cause that you should understand our cause, but I think it's also a principled position, so I think that's one thing. I think the second thing is, it's been talked about a bit, and you're, you're a teacher, so you'll know this. I think there are more things that can be done in schools. You, you'll know that we produced a, a website, ourmigrationstory.org.uk, and it's now, you know, it is now an option at GCSE History to teach the history of migration, and it was only uh, adopted in 2016. And most schools don't know about it. So I think it, as parents and you know, as head teachers or as teachers, I think we could be making sure that more and more schools up and down the country are taught this. And one of the reasons, the, other, the second thing is I think teachers could do more on challenging Islamophobia and racist bullying in schools. I mean, I think one of the problems isn't simply that Muslim children are badly affected. I was in a primary school where a child explained to me that he had been called a terrorist. And uh, it, was, it was sort of six children, and he was the only Muslim. And I could see the five other children also become uncomfortable. You know, they, they were not knowing what to say or what to do. I mean, they were uh, 10 years old, so obviously it wasn't uh, that easy. And I think that is inevitably going to affect their views, right? The, the, the white children, the non-Muslim children who are experiencing that are going to have in their heads, the teachers who are experiencing that. And that is what then leads to the problem. So I think we need to work with schools to sort of challenge that, but also to support teachers, because it is hard to intervene there. So I think we need more sort of practical anti-racist activities to, to respond to bullying. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but that's, um, uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for, for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much, Omar. And I'm afraid that uh, that does mean that we are out of time, and uh, that does mean uh, that we sort of need to bring tonight uh, to a close. And um, thank you very much to uh, Hayan, Isabel, and uh, Omar for giving out the time and for coming here to, to share their research and insights with us tonight. Um, for those of you not familiar with City Circle, um, City Circle was set up 19 years ago. Um, we've been going for some time now, um, as a as a registered charity. Um, initially to provide a sort of safe space for the want of a better term and a forum and a platform for the discussion of uh, issues particularly of relevance to uh, Muslims living in this country and um, particularly sort of aimed at uh, British professional Muslims. Um, <clears throat> we run regular talks here, uh, usually at Arbor House, um, on a range of topics. Um, so for anybody who's not already signed up to our mailing list, um, I think there are probably uh, forms at the back of the room where you can leave details and hear about sort of forthcoming talks. Um, the, the next talk that I know is definitely in the calendar um, is next month, on the 23rd of March. Um, it's called Palestinian, or Palestine Monologues. Uh, so that's going to be a spoken word uh, performance followed by a Q&A session. Uh, we may well have talks uh, between now and then, so as I say, if you're not already signed up to our mailing list, uh, please do leave your details before you go. And also, sorry, you, sorry, this is available free on our <coughs> website, yeah? I brought one copy, but that's because you can download the whole thing if, if you Sorry, I should have said that. Okay. Um, and also, because we are a registered charity, I mean, we don't take, uh, we don't receive sort of governmental grants or, or anything like that. We are supported entirely through um, donations from people like yourselves who come to our events. Um, we don't we don't charge uh, most of the time. So if you haven't heard the talk tonight and uh, you want to support what we're doing, um, there is a collection box at the back of the room. If you could possibly leave us a few pounds, it means that we, uh, we're able to sort of cover the cost of renting the rooms tonight. Um, but uh, for now though, um, thank you very much to our panel once again. Thank you very much to all of you for coming and contributing. Until next time, as well as we come back to our last people.